I know you're gonna dig this. This is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. Today I have Larry Lang with me, the Chief Ambassador for the Funk Museum, and also we're Skyping in all the way from Morrisville, Pennsylvania, interesting character. Mr. Michael Hampton, guitarist for Parliament Funkadelic. Hello. Hello. How are you doing, Ryan? I'm doing good. I'm so glad to have you with us. Yeah, glad to be here. You you have such a smiling face. Is is this such? Is your your face your face just <laughs> speaks volumes, you know? And I can just imagine you playing the guitar and and how the motion and the emotion gets with you, and your face will tell it all. But so leading right <laughs> into that question is tell tell us about yourself and how funk music became a part of your life. Well. Um, I was born in uh, Lurie, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. And um, I've always listened to uh, different records when um, I was coming up. Uh, my parents, you know, had, had so many different styles of music, Bobby Blue Bland and B.B. King and James Brown and Jimi Hendrix and, and, and Sly. It, of course, Funkadelic, you know, and people would bring me their their records to to uh, prove that I could play because, you know, I'm, I was just practicing around. But in order to prove that I could play, I would I would you know play along with the record first, and eventually uh, I got better and I could play uh, without the record, you know, and um, yeah, that's I got introduced just by listening to it. I mean, it, it was everywhere, whether I knew it was um, called that, you know, like Booker T and the MGs or the Watts on Third Street Band, yeah, you yeah, know, especially yeah. says, you know, like, you know, Funky Nassau, you know, uh, slipping in the darkness from, you know, uh, war and everything. As uh, Dr. John, you know, right place, wrong time. Just all, all kind of different, it, I didn't know what it was called, but you know, I just I got introduced probably as, as anybody else was listening to some AM radio back when I was coming up. Anything that came, even the Beatles, you know, I mean, it, it was like they probably had. If you look for it, it's it's a little bit of funk and everything, you know, a little country and western stuff. I watched um, a lot of TV programs like Hee Haw, and it's uh, it's, it's amazing how how similar. The rhythms are, you know, once you once you you get along in life, and you're like, oh, that that sounds funky too. This uh, well, if you put that with this beat, you know, and so it it all kind of translates. But yeah, I, you know, I, I just ever since I was listening to music, you know, I guess I was been exposed to it, whether I knew what it was called or not. Now, it just it just kind of amazes me how similar our upbringings have been. You mentioned the AM radio back in the day, and and hee haw, and I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. I, yeah, I was lis listening to Roy Clark, and I mean the Ohio Players, the Sugarfoot, and you know, I mean, um, it's just just about any anybody that uh, was on the radio, you know, I'm, I was listening to it. Just uh, but the but being introduced to funk, I, I'd say one guy brought that, 
you know, as as a as an album, that first funkadelic album with the heads on it, you know, the kind of a kaleidoscope looking. Uh, I did the first thing I seen that actually had that name or that word incorporated in it was from that album, and that you know, I guess I'd have to say that was my first real introduction. Yeah, well, you know, you know, Mike, I was I was going to ask to tell us something, not a whole lot, but tell us something that no one else knows about you and your relationship with funk. That I'm really a metalhead, but I don't get a chance to really get it off in the funk stuff, you know, because everybody like you know listening to the mood synth and things like that. So it, I don't know. You know, I, I love sub bass and I love I love hard rock. I love, you know, I, that's kind of a, one of my things is that I'm I'm really a, a metalhead, but I I love you know funky grooves too. So I just don't hear. A lot of it mixed together, like say if it was Aerosmith walked his way, or or Queen gets another one bites the dust off, you know, or whatever. But uh, you know, yeah, it's that may be one of my secret things. And I and I love uh, I love me some classical. You know, I will be off into some classical to clean my palate of everything. <laughs> you know, and then and then I'll come back and I I like I like free jazz. I like uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty, I'm all over the place with with a lot of different music. I, I will listen to just about anything all the way through. No matter, even if I don't really like it, I'll still give it that time. <laughs> it's not so much a question; it's just another observation. It's like, well, okay, yeah, it's not a complete oh. secret because I knew okay, that wasn't a secret. Okay, I knew okay. I knew I knew Michael was a metalhead. <laughs> Okay. All right. So that was. I didn't. I didn't know that Michael was a metalhead. But sorry, sorry, sorry. I I just I just kind of just threw that out there. But uh, yeah, my secret relationship. Wow. Hmm. Is that there? The the, this connection that I have sometimes is like is not to like as much as I want to be aggressive. I'm an aggressive player. But um, I seem to I seem to uh, seem to look to lay back more. Um, yeah, that's, that's a hard question. I can't. I mean, my because I, I guess there's no real secrets that I you know I think that I that I have the secrets, but they still kind of get out when I play. You know, so you know there's no secret to somebody that that really they're listening. You know, and um, but the, yeah, it's a it's it's a hard. That's a hard question. Um, Let me ask uh, you this, Mike. At, at at this point, at this like like that the clock stopped now. Looking back over your career thus far, with Parliament and Funkadelic, n- name name three highlights. Something funny, something that, or something that that really that you really enjoyed. Some place where you played, or somebody that you met that was in the business with you. Uh, can you name three highlights of uh, looking that you can tell us about? <laughs> yes. That you can tell us about. I could tell. Okay. <laughs> oh wow! Uh, three highlights. Hmm. Would probably be um, when the, my first gig at the Capitol Center, when I seen my face on the closed circuit TV screen before playing Maggot Brain. Um, when I, that same night, I, I asked everybody for a nine string because I busted the string on my guitar. And this, and I was asking everybody if they had a nine. Nobody had a nine. Highlight there was I had to repair my own string, the old string like I used to do at home. I, I, it worked. That was like, yeah, great. It didn't break during when I would, you know. And uh, pretty much everything that, that happened that first gig with where there was or the first year which which was like when I got the call from Tiki Fullwood, you know, to 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 in my first plane ride, you know, to uh plane in uh, Landover, Maryland at the Capitol Center when it was there. Now it's a mall awesome. But uh, you know, um yeah, it's it's probably probably wanted to hear some other things, but you know, it was some strange highlights. 
you know, Montro was beautiful to play the Montro Jazz Festival, Jazz Festival. to see anything that looked like Montro uh, uh, playing overseas in Japan. Uh, you know, it's 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 more than a, a, you know highlights. It was it's 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 a lot of them, um, and most of them are probably not a highlight moment like. When somebody kicks the door in to the hotel room, and it's your roommate because you didn't get to the door fast enough to let them in. <laughs> but, it, but it still was a highlight. It was, it was New York, man, New York. Yeah. <laughs> they say you can expect anything in New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I mean, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a bad. It was, I mean, some of my highlights. Um, yeah, I, you know. Uh, it's very hard to, uh, you know, just, I mean, of course, I should just say like the, the induction to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame being inducted, but then I botched the speech, you know, but I, I just, I flipped it, you know, I mean, so a bunch of my highlights were a bunch of things that didn't quite happen, you know, didn't continue to highlight, you know, it was a, uh, they kind of it it would it kind of imploded is what I want to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my yeah my highlights is uh, it's hard to really call those out. You know. You uh, know we're really grateful that you um, have chosen to have this conversation with us and and so um, with all your experience and, and your notoriety with being such a uh, dynamic guitarist. Well, I'd like to know what what is your what was your inspiration for the guitar solo knee deep? I know you get asked this a lot of times and you get complimented on it, but at that moment in time, what was your inspiration? What what took you there? What took you musically, spiritually there to the solo of knee deep? Well, you, it can it, it comes it came from a lot of things. Which was like the track itself, which was uh, Junie Morrison um, from the High Players wrote that. Wrote the track was a slamming track. It had it was all kind of uh, mel melodies everywhere, and to pick from. And so when we did those solos, uh, when I did solos like that, I didn't necessarily. I mean, I was inspired. I didn't necessarily follow anybody in particular. Like as far as the, the soulful thing, but 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 the um, but w I've always felt close to BB King, Sugarfoot, um, Chuck Berry, you know, uh, uh, um, Jimi Hendrix, you know. Um, it. I mean, I'm sorry to just drop these names like that. It's it's some some players that I don't even, I'm not even aware of, but I believe Jim. The, oh yeah, the guy that played uh, solo on Fence Walk and um, Santana, of course. You know, it's it was a lot of um, spiritually. I was raised in. I, was, I went to Pentecostal type of church, you know, holiness. But I, I really, um, I, 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 I can't say for sure. Um, you know, I, I have to say. The, the, Hen the Hendrix solo one um, that made it reminds me of it is uh, uh, all along the all along the Watchtower when it was like when it, and the wind began to howl or something. It's just something that it after the solo took off after that after what he after that um, lyric, you know, is kind of where my where my uh, my soul is. I'm always trying to climb, you know. And like fence walk was a, a solo that I, I've uh, patterned off of. That's in the, the vamp on Cosmic Slop. But uh, it was mainly the, the melody lines, you know, uh, in the in the song. I was always trying to uh, enhance what was already there, you know. And so it was a combination of of the of the guitar itself, which was uh, a custom guitar. About BC Rich, BC Rich, bitch, B I C H, mm -hmm. and that guitar had two preamps, and it was all the way up. It was, it was in, it, 
everything was cranked and for the solo and I, I listened to it a couple passes and, and they just let me go you know on the solo so I, you know so it's it yeah, the inspiration came from everything that was there while I was listening to it and before before I actually played on the track but but it helps having a great instrument you know it helps the the guitar actually was playing itself and then and then that guitar uh had uh ten it had a ten, it was a ten string and i tuned the i tuned the guitar in fifths perfect fifths or so i was getting a kind of a, a di- some harmony from it and it was almost like I, I had you know i had another guitar player playing with me you know st- instead of teaching them the harmony it was already in in the guitar itself but but i mean in, in the tuning itself but yeah the, the, the sound of the guitar inspired me um the uh the, some of the irony of of, of people uh, uh that before me passing like you know uh like jimmy Hendrix or and um to, to just things of that sort um it's just it's, it's a little bit of everything there's a lot of irony and um and and me uh, just trying to to strike out, you know. I practice all the time. I used, I mean, I used to practice every waking moment. I slept with the guitar, did the whole thing, and so it was almost like second second nature. Whatever was happening at the time, I just channeled channeled it. We 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 recorded all the time. It was like almost nonstop, you know. It was at a, a United Sound. Um, studios next to Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. There, and um, it was almost a, a automatic. Everybody's, on, you know, pretty much on full tilt. You know, he, turn it up and <laughs> turn it up and go for it. Yeah. He answered the question I was going to ask because uh, I'm like you know nerdy, geeky gear type questions, and uh, he was talking about the BC Rich Ten String, and I was going to ask him. If he had the extra four strings on it, and if so, how were they tuned? Yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. So you turn you t- you tuned the extra four and fifths. Yeah, like the top, the top would the top strings were tuned in regular, and just underneath the extra ones were like a fourth or a fifth down. Oh, okay, all right, cool. Yeah, yeah. so it, I could I could still bend it, you know, was yeah, it? yeah, hard to bend. But that's what gives it the strange type of harmonic. If you hear it, if, if listen, you're like, like us geeks listen to something. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm sorry, I did, probably wasn't. I tried to answer the questions. I, you know, I go off. Well, I, I think like, you did, he, <laughs> Mike. You, you, you're doing good. You're doing good. Just, uh, just, go ahead. One of the questions I, I wanted to ask you is that, um, being that you're, you've been so gracious during this interview and that we appreciate that because we're, we're with the Funk Chronicles and we're talking about the Funk Mu- Museum and Exhibition Center and education, it's going to have, a, it has an education component to it. It just uh, opened up at, uh, we have a room up at the new library here in Dayton, Ohio, where we have some uh, exhibits from Funksters that have been put in there and so I, I, I need you to show your support for this and, and explain to us why you think it's important that we do have a funk museum. Well, uh, you know, the, like I said, it, before I um, knew what it was called, you know, I mean, they gave it a name, you know, something that's funky, this fun, funk, that, it goes way way back you know so it's just like as far back as you could go you know you could trace that before it probably had the name funk and it would help um it help future generations to to understand where it actually came from whether if you if you went back to africa and afro-cuban or whatever i don't know you know whatever drum beats there are you know it, it it will um it will help, you know, anybody that likes funky music as they know it, whenever they pick it up along the way, whoever introduces 
them to it or they it just get that you just get a feeling and and then you're trying to find out what the feeling is it's it's gonna lead you back to that funk it's just something that not everybody i mean you either have it or you don't just like a lot of other people some people they they're, they're better at other genres than others and then and the funk is like it's it's a little niche where you know everybody probably has it and it just hasn't been uh tapped into or they don't really you know nobody explained it to them and it would be a place where you know they they could hear somebody do uh um like some it could be like some symphonic overture thing with a funky beat you know it's only a matter of time before somebody you know loops up something that's really classical or baroque or or Afro, you know like a some other genre of music, jazz or what have you, you know, uh, any culture could go all the way back to some, some very native uh, beginnings, but then, you know, they, they could find it, they could link it up, you know, if they want to find out and say, oh man, that was the beat that was uh, in So Makosa, or they, they did that in the Tom Tom Club, or the Tom Tom Club did it. Or that beat is like I mean I don't want to drop you know any name, but just like James Brown, James Brown and and um what's the guy, oh man Fela, yeah oh Fela Cody, yeah you know and, I, and, and there's a I just was watching something on 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 Jaco, on uh, a documentary on Netflix, and uh, it's amazing you know that he listened to all this, the different types of music and funk was one of them. And um, yeah, you know it's 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 important to to, to talk different uh, cultures, you know, and uh, different genres of music that um, people have some place to go. And if what you know, why not Dayton? You know, why not you know other places uh, on the planet? You know, where they, we can put the, these uh, uh, facilities, you know, in order. You know, to kind of uh, teach people about it, you know, and from lifestyle to actually, what do you feel when you're playing it? You know, I, you know, it's what makes you feel it. What you like the connection thing? I really, I, I could say going back to that, to, uh, going back to a connection question, is the fade, the fade on slipping in the darkness is probably when I really felt whatever funk was and it was it was on the fade of the song when it went dun, 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 you know what I mean and you know that's hard to explain it's like but that's when I sort of felt it and then I started hearing you know like uh, funky Nash so I started dialing in more and then and then um you know James Brown and you know super bad and stuff like that you know but um yeah I'm all over the place again but yeah that's a place <laughs> That would be a place for the people to go, you know, and, and you need more time to, to, to explain it and break it down, you know. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's it's important to have a if, a museum for, um, you know, artists like that, you know, like myself, and because not everybody can explain it. And, and a lot of us, you know, I never thought I'd get this, you know, the age I am now, 59. But, you know, so, you know, you try to share as much of you can, as much of it as I can, you know, I'm still around here, and you know, and then uh, pass it on, you know. It, well, uh, you, well, you look good for 59. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, you. you you're, you're very welcome. and. And, and Dayton, of course, you, uh, you are well aware that Dayton has had many, many funksters come out of here. Oh, and, yeah. And so that's why we're really promoting Dayton to be the home of the funk sure, sure. museum and exhibition center. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I have one other thing to ask you, and I know Larry has some of his uh, questions he likes to ask, which are more detailed. <laughs> I'm what you call a funk messenger, and uh, Larry is the funk 
ambassador slash nerd. <laughs> and, and so therefore, <laughs> he gets into the technical part. I, I am just the messenger. I'm the one that helps you lighten up, Mike, so that you can give us all these fluid answers that you've given us that from the beginning when we were just warming up. It's just sure. that I feel like our guitar is really running good now because you're playing <laughs> smooth. Um, yeah. what, what would you be willing to donate to our museum here in Dayton? That's a, a few things, but I just can't really uh, put them out, you know, right now. I couldn't say exactly what. But you are willing. Yeah, definitely willing, we're, yeah. We really appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure that 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 you uh, knew that, that that we wanted you something especially. And I, I really want something from you, especially now, Mike. I feel that we have a personal relationship. Sure, sure. A bunch, bunch of things. Um, I'm coming across, and there's a, and and that, you know, it, it, they definitely speak as to who they go to. <laughs> so, so, I'm gonna, I'll keep the funkin' uh, the museum in mind. You know, it could be, could be a guitar that, that I had before they gave me my first Strat. I may, I may donate that. It's a frame, but you know, I, I'll, it's hard to, to let go of these things. But it's it's like the guitar I had before they bought me a a, a stock Stratocaster, which became um, the, the P Funk Strat. It had the it had it it had the rhinestones, and I I customized it, had it customized. But uh, yeah, it's don't worry. I'm gonna hook I'm gonna hook the museum up. Well, 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 we really appreciate that. Hey, I like now. Nah, I like that, Mike. I like hearing that, Larry. Uh, just kind of piggybacking on the hooking us up thing, and um, uh, Michael, like so many others, um, have mentioned, want to give back. You know, want to share. And uh, if you know, if you'd be available for clinics, you know, master class kind of things, uh, when you're in when you're in town, that would be great. Or near the area, yeah. near or, the nearest. Um, yeah, yes, sir. Just set it up. I mean, I'm really my schedule is for for the most part all open, and it just give me an idea of what what we can do, and I'm there. Uh, I'm not on a tour or nothing like that. I'm trying to, you know, I I'd be willing to, you know, record with the artists there. You know, if they're coming up. You know, you got some studio things. We could learn it right. You could do it like that, you know, uh, firsthand, you know, recording an uh, artist that you mentored, uh, you know, L.A. However we can do it, you know, uh, I'm, I'm want to really, I'm, I'm, I'm open, you know. Wow. Just, uh, really, I, really getting I, wheels I, turning right now. I, I, <laughs> I tell you, uh, Mike, you, you have uh, uh, really almost made me speechless with, with your offer there because there's so many things that we can do with that and, and that you have given that offer. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure, you know, I've always, I've always had a goal, and, and one of my goals was I wanted to be a roadie to somebody, you know, and I always asked Shirley Murdoch, can I be your roadie? You know, I just want to do a roadie one time. Okay. And so now I heard that there's a TV show coming out that's going to be about roadies, and it okay. doesn't look like it was the glamour I thought it was. So you, oh. what 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 does a roadie do? Maybe I should ask that. I always heard oh. that. Now, what does a roadie <laughs> yeah. do? That's Did you a, have roadies? Yeah, it, it was some roadies, and actually, roadies will make it, you know, to make it a little bit too easy for you, you know, when it, you know, like you'll get a roadie. To, to change the strings, Rody will uh, set up the amplifiers, uh, it's do everything but play the guitar for you. Just about, yeah. <laughs> you know, if, sure. if you know, but they 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 repair the equipment, they make sure it all works fine, and, and uh, it could be any number of things. Depends on what level the Rody is is on, you know, because not everybody can change strings. Not everybody can fix the amplifier. You know, everybody might be able to go, you know, get a cup of coffee or something. I don't know. But they, it's, it, could, it could be a number of things. It depends on the, um, the artist and the relationship he has. 
I, me personally now, I mean, even though I'm a little older, I prefer to do it myself because if I had a, did more hands-on, then I would have recognized what was really going on. And Rody will make it make it so good for you. You be you might believe that you don't really have to do nothing else after that. But <laughs> you know, so it's it's it depends. It, it, it's a it's a hard it's a hard job. You know, driving the trucks, loading loading and unloading the equipment, and um, yeah, it's a little little bit little bit of everything. They get their hands dirty more ways than one. So, so uh, uh, do you do the roadies go with you, or do you get get them in each town? You, you. Yeah, yeah. They depends. You know, see that, that, that that's a good question. It, that could be both. You know, you could depends on how you you know you're traveling. Like if if I if I came somewhere and I needed to have somebody assist me, and I um, like that, then it'd be good to have them on hand. It makes it a little easier carrying the equipment, carrying the guitars, set it up. And I can focus on other things, but yeah, they if you if you're touring, they're usually traveling with you, and if you you know probably more solo, and sparse in in how you show up, you could you could have one meet you there, or usually people have them, they have somebody designated. It's a more personable thing, and and but, but out of town. They just have people that they can do it for anybody that comes through town. You know, the reason why I was uh, 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 talking about that is that so uh, as we talk about the business earlier on all aspects of the business mm -hmm. and that people need to know in the business, oh. there's down to a roadie mm -hmm. all the way up to a business manager or, or other things like that. And since we are, you know, it's the... Funk Museum and Exhibition Center mm -hmm. with the education yeah. component yeah. that young people out there listening you might see, you know, and, and some of the movies and stuff they see. I actually know what does a roadie do? Right. I've never been hired as a roadie. I've, yeah. I've only, well, I've only asked one person. <coughs> and that was Shirley Murdoch. Uh, so, uh, well, I'll tell you what. Yeah, I will that, start a that's, band. That, I, you might, might have been bringing the microphone for, to her. <laughs> 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 you know. Like, it, it might have been it, it, but that. And then I said I can't say anything, but she may be doing some. She may do some other things. But it's like, uh, as far as an instrument, the microphone would be her instrument. You'd make sure that it was set up right for her. You'd be more like an assistant, you know. Now, if you could fix a microphone, you'd be really a roadie. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's another another aspect of it, but. Uh, yeah, it, it, Rody in in her case, in that case, would be more, probably more like a, an assistant, you know, as opposed to uh, somebody that actually could fix the microphone, <laughs> you know. But I, I have uh, a question to ask. That's interesting to note. That say that you were playing in a town, something happened to your instrument. How? How do you get that done? And do, it, it, do you have a hookup where do you have a central music place where you could go that 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 you are in touch with around the country or wherever you are in a locale that um, maybe like in Dayton it might have been Howard Music that you would contact it within that radius of maybe a hundred miles that you would have a professional music place that you would go to. How do you handle that? Because I think that's something you always got to know when you're traveling. Because some yeah. instrument could get stolen, something could happen, break in or something. Usually, some. I mean, I'm not saying that everybody has a a friend that has a friend that has a friend, but uh, it, if if it's not a place that's just professionally, you know, like that stays open 24/7, which it does got to be places, you know, like that. But most of the time, people are. And artists are they at least at least have an extra guitar, or somebody has an extra. It's 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 not too far away, you know. If you if you if you're you're in the circuit, and you're doing some shows, and something goes wrong, somebody in that whole organization, the whole the, the venue, they will have they can put their hands on another guitar. Depends on how serious it is, but usually. Um, anybody that's doing shows like that, depending on uh, uh, 
against their budget or whatever. But for the most part, you know, it, somebody will always have something to do. They'll help you out. They got the little. If they got a piece of microphone, they got another guitar. They got an amp. They got a buddy. Got a you know. Somebody knows somebody, and then if it if it's not like on a real high scale, like you say, people that that are doing these big tours, whether it's Beyonce or when Prince was doing his, and you know, and you got those. That's a whole nother, you know. That that's probably a a tech community within it in the tour, you know. <laughs> yeah, like they they probably got the whole store traveling with them. Uh, but, <laughs> But you know, uh, but but I'm sure you know, and that's how it would work too. It would work like somebody in the club, you know. It depends on the people that you know and who they know, and usually that's never really a problem. It would really have to be uh, devastating. Some they would have to really do something really bad to the instrument or the amp for it not to be fixed. You know, they usually have a backup of some sort. I, I always yeah. wanted to know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was a little bit too, too much on that one, but yeah, usually they they have spares, you know, for for just such an emergency, especially if they want the show to go on. If they if they really don't want it to go on, and then <laughs> you know they they might not have that. Right? <laughs> it may by the time they get the replacement, you know, people might want to be going home or something. I don't know, but uh, Larry. It's good um, to it's good to bring your own. God bless a child that, that has his own. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, bring bring your own backup, you know, if you can. <laughs> you know <laughs> if you can. I was just gonna say I'll I'll start a band. You can be you can be a roadie if you want, Ryan. Oh, oh okay, okay. You can carry my yeah. amp. I can carry yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah. Aren't those kind of heavy? <laughs> Very heavy. Yeah, they got wheels on them. You can roll it in, you know what I mean? Oh, I can roll it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought he was going to give me a job like I could bring the sheet music. Did you ever <laughs> did you did you ever go to school for uh your your guitar playing or did you just per learn by ear and hand? I I, I was self-taught for 2 years and then I, I took uh lessons from uh the late John DiCero in Cleveland, Ohio. He he was a jazz player, and basically, um, he taught me technique. You know, where I wouldn't really have to. He, I could always do tricks. You know, you get a lot of flat, flashier players now uh, to do do a lot of tricks with the guitar. And um, but he was he was just by the book. He said you can always do, you know, the tricks. But he taught me some techniques and. Um, and then, uh, yeah, he was a, he was a jazz guitarist. Yeah. If you had, we're winding up, but what would one thing that you would like to let our listeners know that comes from you, Michael Hampton, the Parliament Funkadelic guitarist? What would you? What would be your parting words to us? What are your parting words to us? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, if, there's, if, if there's anybody in your family that is interested in music, you know, encourage them to go to school for reading it, to, to really um, absorb the reading it as, as an early age as possible, and and then um, and in acting, take you know, if they want to get into the arts. Get into all of the arts, not only just playing, but acting, painting. You know, um, take care of your health, and on on all that on all uh, on all aspects, and then um, and and have other occupations that will be of use in the future. Like try to try to see ahead. To what's where it's going to, instead of where you're at at the, at the time. So it's a kind of a lot of a uh, lot of a lot that everybody probably tells people cryptically, you know. And I'm trying to do it, and I'm still kind of cryptic too. But yeah, it's like basically don't 
don't put all your eggs in one basket or something, you know. <laughs> that's, that's always good advice. That, that's great advice, Michael. Thank you yeah. so much for being with us. Larry, you got a kind of final comment? Uh, just thanks, uh, Mike, for taking the time. And sure. uh, if you can, like I said, share in the future uh, knowledge, uh, the education aspect of the, of the Funk uh, Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center is a, a big part of it. And I sure. think you can teach a lot to a lot of people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to you know stay in touch. I'm, I'm right here, and um, yeah, thank thanks for having me. And uh, I'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll, I'll talk to everybody again soon. I hope. Well, this yeah. is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until the next time. Keep it funky. Thank you.